Hello, welcome. Thank you everybody for coming. My name's Josie and this is Will and we're going to be running this training. We've just got an hour, so what we're going to try and do, we're basically going through a new training format for trying to get the People's Assembly format in a way that people can just pick it up, take it and go and facilitate an assembly. So this is our aim. So what we're going to do is just go round and just take it in turns to say your name and just very briefly, if you have any experience in people's assemblies. Um, so this is probably going to be easier if I hand the mic round and then this will get picked up as well, okay? So I'll start here. My name's Rob, I've experience in facilitation but not in people's assemblies. Hi, I'm Tim and I've got no experience in people's assemblies. Hi, I'm Dacre, uh, I've participated in people's assemblies but never facilitated. Ross, yeah, same for me, participated but not facilitated. Hi, I'm Deb, same for me as well. I haven't facilitated, but I have been in a People's Assembly. Richard, I haven't participated and I haven't facilitated. Um, hi, Jackie, I'm, yeah, I've uh, taken part in quite a few, but not faci facilitated. <laughs> hi, I'm Susan and I haven't participated or facilitated. Hi, I'm Emma, and nope, no experience at all. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I've done facilitation, but not for people's assemblies, and I have taken part in a, a, a people's assembly as well. I'm Andy. I have no experience with people's assemblies, but I do have to convene one shortly. <laughs> I'm Alex. I read all about it, and I've had a go at facilitating one, and I haven't taken part in one, so I really <laughs> need this training. Hello, I'm Chris, and no experience at all in Citizens' Assembly. Hi, I'm Geraldine. Um, I have very little experience with people's assemblies. Hi, I'm Jeff, and if I'm right, I took part in two in April in Marble Arch. Hi, I'm Sue. Uh, um, I've never been in one, but um, I think we're about to try and organise one, so that's why I'm here today. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm here to help Sue organise a, a People's Assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah? I, I will. Yeah, no, I will do. I'll clarify that in a minute because they're two very different things. There are elements that are similar, um, but they are two very different things. So, yeah, I will do that. Peoples, yeah, this is absolutely for peoples. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'll just quickly go through the agenda with you just so you have an idea of the structure of how we're going to do this. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the hand signals, which I hope a lot of you know, but it's a really important part of, whole, of how we hold the conversations, of how we hold the discussions, not just in people's assemblies, but also within meetings and the way that we, we organise within Extinction Rebellion. So, And then I'm going to give you the intro to people's assemblies, what they are, how they differ from citizens' assemblies, how they've been used in revolutionary movements and how we're using them in Extinction Rebellion. Then we're going to talk about the three pillars and the children's fire, the roles within assemblies and the structure, which is the input and information phase, the deliberation phase, which is the conversation, and then the output or the feedback, the integration phase. In amongst that, we're going to give out uh, scripts, which is our basic people's assembly scripts, and then Will is going to help to facilitate you guys to actually go through working through part of the script and actually delivering it to each other in small groups so you get an idea of how that feels, okay? So first of all, hand signals. Um, so we use hand signals in assemblies and in meetings in order to keep the conversation going in a way where no voices dominate, where everybody gets a chance to speak, where people don't talk for too long, and where we create a, a, a system of communicating where we don't talk over each other and we can easily see when we have consensus. So I'm just going to introduce the hand signals to you now and it'd be really good if you just do them with me. I'm sure you all know them, but it's a really important part of how we structure an assembly. Okay, so if you would like to speak, 
one finger up. This is, I would like to speak, this is a point, okay? If you're facilitating a group or a conversation or a meeting, you're looking for the fingers going up. That's the order in which people want to speak. And you keep an eye on that. So you say you, and then you, and then you. The only exception to that is if somebody puts their finger up who hasn't spoken very much or who hasn't spoken at all, then they can jump the stack. So as a facilitator, you're also keeping an eye on who's talking a lot and who's not spoken very much. The second one is a direct point. Direct point is two fingers. We like to think of it as brackets. A direct point is often used inappropriately. So a direct point is if somebody is saying something, if someone's asking a question or talking about a particular thing and you have a piece of information that directly relates to what they're saying that they are missing, then you can put two fingers up as a direct point. The facilitator will say, we've got a direct point. So someone's saying, you know, we really want to do this, but we don't have X, Y, and Z, and we need it. And you know that actually we do have Z, and it's already in place. You can do a direct point and say, actually, we've got lots of Z, and that's already been covered. And then you go back into the stack. <coughs> uh, so how do we show consensus? How do we show that we agree? Wavy hands. Brilliant. This is really important because when we have conversations, we're quite used to the idea that if we agree with what somebody's saying, whilst they're still talking, we say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant, I agree. And also, so what we're actually doing by showing agreement is we're talking over the top of somebody else. So by using the wavy hands, we enable people to speak and say what they need to say without interrupting them. It also is the way that the note takers looking for the consensus of a whole group can easily see the ideas or the points that have got the most agreement and make a note of it. Um, clarification. If somebody says something that you don't understand, make a C shape with your hands. This goes for this training, this goes for everything that we're doing here. So it's not just when you're in breakout groups. If we're saying something here and you don't understand what we're saying, C shape with your hands and we will clarify what we mean. It's really important because there's no point in us just standing here and waffling and you don't know what we're talking about, okay? So if you need us to clarify what we mean, clarification. Speak up. A lot of us are not used to speaking so that other people can hear us. Can everybody hear me at the back, by the way? So, so. All right, I'll try and project my voice. I might stand up in a minute and pace about, possibly, as well. Um, so, yeah, speak up. And then rounding up. Everybody gets two minutes to speak. So if they're coming to the end of that two minutes and you need them to, to round up what they're saying, rounding up. We used to do this but that feels a bit rude. So now we just do a really nice rounding up, okay? And the, the last one is a technical point. You make a T-shape with your hands. Technical point is a piece of information that is outside to the conversation. So technical point means I need to stop this conversation immediately because there is an external pressure or uh, you know incident. So technical point, the tent's on fire. Or technical point, the police are moving in. Or even, technical point, I'm the note taker and I'm so desperate for a wee that if I don't leave right now, I'm going to wet myself so someone needs to take over. Okay? Everybody got the hand signals? Wonderful. Okay, so an intro to people's assemblies. And I am going to partly read from my script. This is just to make sure that because it's being filmed that I cover everything. I'm also quite tired at this point in the, in the proceedings. So... <coughs> People's assemblies, what are they? A way for a group of people to discuss issues or make decisions collectively where all voices are heard and valued equally and no one person or group are able to dominate the process. Assemblies can be a form of direct action if they're being held in a space designed to be disruptive or during occupations. That's basically it. In its simplest form, it is a way for groups of people to come together and collectively discuss issues or questions or problems or ideas where all voices are heard and heard equally. The framework that we use allows that to happen. How are they different from citizens' assemblies? So a citizens' assembly brings people together to learn, deliberate and make recommendations on an issue of public concern. <coughs> Similar to jury service, members are randomly selected from the population by a process called sortition. Quotas are used to ensure that the assembly is representative in terms of key characteristics such as gender, age, ethnicity, education level and geography. 
Assembly members learn about critical thinking before they hear balanced information from experts and stakeholders. The members spend time deliberating in small facilitated groups and then they draft and vote on recommendations. Citizens' assemblies are conducted by non-partisan organisations under independent oversight. They are transparent, inclusive and effective. So a people's assembly is self-selected. So people choose to take part in a people's assembly. They might be in the right place at the right time. They might be invited and choose to participate as a member of a group. It might be part of an occupation. They are self-selected, so they hold the legitimacy of the group of people that turn up, basically. The things that are similar about people's assemblies and citizens' assemblies is the process by which we hold the discussion. So a people's and citizens' assembly will have the input phase. So for a people's assembly, that could be a question or it could be some speakers on a particular issue that then people go and discuss the issue in their groups. For a citizens' assembly, it would be the panel of experts that deliver the information about what is being discussed. The way that the deliberation, so the conversation part happens, is pretty much the same. So in both people's and citizens' assemblies, they use small groups, we call them breakout groups, of about eight to 10 people who have a facilitator to ensure that the discussion is, is kept going, that nobody dominates, that there is roughly equal speaking time across all of the different areas, and somebody to take note of what comes out of that. We're using people's assemblies quite extensively through Extinction Rebellion in terms of looking at how we organise, how we hear the voice of large groups of people, also as a form of outreach, but the third demand is for a citizens' assembly. Yeah, okay. People's assemblies, participatory democracy, people's assemblies have a long revolutionary history, originating in the global south. In fact, people's assemblies were at the heart of several revolutions in Latin America, as well as several revolutionary movements in Africa. In 2001, over the course of what became known as the Arab Revolt, participatory democracy assemblies sparked revolutionary movements across North Africa, from Tunisia to Egypt, famously in Tahrir Square, where the dictator Mubarak was deposed. To this day, participatory democracy people's assemblies are used in revolutionary movements in Africa, including the YNMR in Senegal, who took down a dictator through participatory democracy and hip hop. If you're interested in people's assemblies and how it can be used, look up the YNMR, it's fantastic. It's Y, the letter Y, and then N-E-N-A, and then M-A-R-R-E in Senegal. Um, where have we got to? Uh, in 2011, the Arab Spring movement that ended in Tahrir Square spread to Syntagma Square in Greece with the anti-austerity movement and then famously to the Indignados or the 15M movement in Spain. At its height, the 15M movement had 80 assemblies being held in Madrid every week alone, which is amazing. The level of trust that people put in that process to turn up week after week, 80 individual assemblies a week across Madrid. And people were turning up because they were being heard. Because being in assembly with all these other people that were, were part of their community and being listened to and being able to put their voice forward and that actually meaning something, that actually going somewhere. That's just, that's a huge, a huge powerful trust that people have put in this process. So it has an amazing history, amazing roots. Um, uh, soon after the 15M movement, the Occupy movement began in Zuccotti Park in New York. This also had people's assemblies at the heart of the movement. At its height, the global Occupy movement had 2,000 camps across the world in one weekend. It's no surprise that the Extinction Rebellion movement also has at its heart participatory democracy people's assemblies. So we're just building on a, a, a huge, rich heritage and a lot of... <coughs> a lot of the learning that we have taken into how we use people's assemblies within XR has come from these other movements. So we've direct contact with the 15M movement and with movements in Africa. So a lot of, our, a lot of the way that we've sculpted how we're using assemblies has been directly informed by these other movements. So <coughs> within Extinction Rebellion, we use them in, in four kind of distinct ways. So we use them for decision making in groups. We use them away as a way of holding meetings to make decision in groups. 
So rather than, you know, your, your kind of standard meetings where someone sort of stood up there telling everybody what's going to happen and then maybe you go and vote on it, we use people's assemblies to actually work together as a, group, as a group to generate the wisdom of the whole group to answer questions. Um, ways of organising. Again, we use people's assemblies to get uh, an idea of how people want to do things across the movement. So we hold people's assemblies at different points to generate feedback across the whole movement. Direct action. Assemblies are wonderful. Uh, how many of you guys were in London in April? Okay, so if you were, you probably saw that we held a lot of assemblies. We held assemblies with teach outs where we had people speaking on different topics and then people deliberating about how they felt about those issues. But we also used them in front of police lines. We used them as a, as a method of essentially occupation and de-escalation. Because if you've got, like a, at Oxford Circus, if you've got a massive police cordon and a hell of a lot of people in a small space and it could get quite intense, why not sit there and hold an assembly, invite all the gathered people, all the crowd, anybody, to come and discuss something about what you're doing, sit there together, let everybody's voice be heard. So as an occupation tool, they're an incredibly powerful um, piece of, of non-violent direct action, as well as generating ideas from the crowd who are gathered as to what you want to do. So in long occupations, you can have them as a, as a kind of feedback mechanism for how you want to progress. You know, what should we do next week? What should we do tomorrow? But they're also used for quick decision making. So the police have given us two hours to get off the bridge. Does everybody want to stay or go? Who wants to stay? Who wants to go? Okay, we stay. You know, so, and you can, you can use these frameworks within the ways that you're actually holding occupations at all different levels. And as a feedback mechanism. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and as a feedback mechanism. Um, so, you know, you want to feedback on a certain topic, you get people to hold assemblies, you generate feedback. Okay, so people's assemblies, as we use them, are built on the three pillars. And the three pillars are radical inclusivity, active listening, and trust. And these are the three things that underpin everything that we do within assemblies. So radical inclusivity is, uh, effective assemblies achieve radical inclusivity where the emphasis on all being heard and valued equally means no voices are dominating and the collective wisdom of the assembly can be reached. People can participate safely and openly without fear or judgment or ridicule. Radical inclusivity is a practical step to widening a movement through providing agency to all who participate. It also means being aware of potential barriers to engagement and working with those affected to enable participation. So think about disabled access, is there a need for sign language, and when you're actually holding an assembly saying, are there any barriers to engagement that we need to work together to find a way to remove? Active listening. It's easy to start mapping out in your mind what your response may be while someone is still talking. We do this all the time. Active listening is focusing on hearing someone all the way through before developing your response. Assemblies are not an arena for intellectual jousting or point scoring, but a place that recognises that no one personal group holds all the answers and that through the wisdom of the crowds, we achieve powerful intelligence about the core issues being discussed. When somebody's talking, give them your full attention. When they've finished, then formulate your response, if you need to, or wait for the next person. So we also use wait, which means why am I talking? So if you're about to say something, I encourage everybody to think, wait, why am I talking? Am I doing this habitually? Do I need to say this? Or could I perhaps step back and give a space for somebody that perhaps hasn't spoken yet? And trust. Once the system and process for people's assemblies has been agreed on, it's essential that all participants trust the process, trust the facilitators and trust the various working groups involved. It's not meant to be a perfect system and can only be effective if people trust that those involved have come together in humility to work towards decisions and actions that are best for all. So active listening, radical inclusivity and trust. Okay then. So. Um uh, Josie's given you kind of like a bit of uh, background into people's assemblies. Um, often that, you know, that might not feel like it's going to necessarily allow you to go ahead and facilitate your own people's assembly. So what we've put together to help you to actually 
do your own people's assemblies is a script, okay? Now, if you were to like show up with this script and just read from the script, you would have a successful people's assembly, but it's important to like practice what's actually going to go on in the assembly, okay? So um, we've got 10 scripts. I'm hoping that's go we're going to form you into groups of four, okay? So within a people's assembly, we like to have two facilitators. Uh, so we have co-facilitators. It's really important if at all possible, that one of those facilitators, one of your two facilitators in a people's assembly is a woman. Because it's been shown that if you have just two men standing up on stage, um, this massively um, disempowers, or it doesn't disempower men, sorry, having a woman, having one of the facilitators being a woman, is uh, it, sh it massively empowers other women in the audience to feel like they can have their voice heard. If you've only got two men, then you tend to just hear the voices of men more, whereas if you've got one of those people facilitating being a woman, then you tend to get much closer to 50-50 in terms of the amount, of the amount that you're hearing from the different voices. So, what I would like you to do in a couple of moments is firstly to get into pairs. So you're going to be a facilitator and a co-facilitator. Preferably, these will be mixed gender groups, okay? So you'll have a facilitator and a co-facilitator. One of you is going to be facilitator number one. One of you is going to be facilitator number two. And you'll see on the script that you've got different parts of the assembly that is facilitator one and facilitator two, okay? So share out the kind of bits that you're talking about into those two different roles. What we're going to do is we're going to get your pair to join up with another pair, so you'll then be in groups of four, and if you could practice going through the script, okay? Practice what you're going to say. See if you can like make it so that what's written on this script, you can say it in your own voice, okay? So you're not necessarily just reading off the script. So we're going to give you a go just like talking through uh, facilitator one, then facilitator two, then swap to the other pair, okay? Only going to have 10 minutes to go through this, so you're not going to have a chance to go through all of it. It's just to get a flavor of what's going on. The bits we'd like you to focus on, okay, are pages one to page six, okay? So that is the whole... Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Don't worry, though, because you'll have the script and you can, like, finish off this practice before you actually go and facilitate your own assembly, okay? So this is like having a go at using the script, basically, okay? So focus on page one to page six. This is the input section of the people's assembly. So the first bit is all about um, the, uh, the children's flame. The second bit is introducing the hand signals. Then it's back to people's uh, facilitator one with what is a people's assembly, which is a lot of what Josie's just talked through. Um, there's the inclusivity statement. Then facilitator two is talking about the three pillars, which was uh, radical inclusivity, active listening, and trust. Then facilitator one on page five is what is the aim of this people's assembly? Ignore that bit for now, okay? Ignore that bit, because the second part of this training, we're going to come back to forming questions, okay? And how you actually like develop your question. And then, so you're going to go straight through to uh, facilitator two, how does a people's assembly work? So this is all about introducing the concept of a people's assembly and then making it so that people know how to actually uh, act within that people's assembly, okay? So get yourselves into pairs, then get yourselves into groups of four, have a go at interacting with this script, see how you feel about it. If you need any help from Josie or me, whilst you're in this sort of 10 minute section, stick your hand up and we'll come and help out. Are there any clarifying questions before we go into that? Yes, please. Quickest you can do it in. The whole assembly will not... This bit where you make sure that everyone who's there knows what the hell's going on. This would normally take like the... <sighs> depends. In, in, normal, in normal conditions where you're doing like a proper people's assembly, this bit is gonna take 20 to 30 minutes. However, if you've got a bunch of people on the street in an occupation, they've already taken part in a couple of people's assemblies and you need to make a decision right now because there's something going on, the police are coming to threaten to arrest you all, you can rattle through this in five minutes in emergency situations, but that is like really kind of pinching everything and just being like, you all know how to do a people's assembly, get on with it. 
Like, you know, it's like, it's not ideal, basically. Um, because, like, yeah, we like to sort of train everyone in the hand signals and remind everyone about that before they go in. Um, so, the group of four, how, how does that work? Um, so, I would say two of you practice one bit to the other two and then give it to the other two to try to practice it back. So, and just like use it as a chance to like talk through the script, see how you're feeling about whether the script works for you. You're not going to have enough time to actually go through the whole thing, read it through, see how you feel about it. We're really pushed for time, I'm sorry. It would be ideal to give you like half an hour, 40 minutes with this section, but unfortunately we just don't have time. Okay, yeah. so I've got about five minutes to go through all of the rest of this with you. So uh, if everybody can just uh, quiet down, we're going to go through this quickly and then you're going to go back into your groups again for the second part of this training, okay? So what is the aim of this people's assembly? This is part of your script. This is about the background and the framing of your assembly, okay? Why have you convened this assembly? When you're looking at the, the question or the topic or how you frame a question, there are several things that you need to know. Who has convened this assembly and to what end? What is it that you want to generate by holding this assembly? An assembly loses the trust if it just becomes a paper exercise, okay? So you have to think about your question and how people will interact with it. You have to think about how you're going to structure the assembly in terms of if you have an awful lot of breakout groups, have you got enough facilitators? How are you going to generate the feedback and get that feedback back in? And almost the most important thing is where is that feedback going to go? Where are the results of this people's assembly going to go? Is this just a feedback to the local group so you get an idea? Is this feeding into a national conversation? Where are the results going to go? So in order to frame your assembly so people understand the process and have trust in the legitimacy of that process, you have to frame it for yourself first, okay? Um, and then state your question. So a good, worded, a good question is worded in accessible language, not too long and is broad enough to allow for free discussion, but not so broad that a structured conversation around it is difficult. Yes. Um, a question from the previous statement you were making. What happens if you don't know how many people are going to turn up to that meeting <laughs> to form the people assembly? You, then you, you have to work on it as you go. So uh, I'll explain the different, thing, the, the different ways that that can affect how you, uh, how you deal with the feedback phase. So at, the, at this point, you're framing the question, you're thinking about your question, you're delivering your question to the assembly. Then the assembly splits off into breakout groups. Okay, breakout group is about eight people. Anything under five, and it's not a great conversation. Over 10, it's unmanageable. People don't get a chance to speak. Each breakout group has one facilitator and one note taker. The note taker's job is to record the will of the group. They're not minuting a meeting. They just need to write down the points that get the most consensus. You then give those breakout groups usually about 25 minutes, half an hour deliberation time. So they have facilitated conversations in the breakout groups. Yeah, clarification. Um, going back on the facilitators, mm -hmm. uh, will these facilitators, if you're having members of the public coming in, yeah. will you normally expect members of the public to be doing the, the facilitating or will you see facilitators into those groups? Ideally, if you have a bank of experienced facilitators that you can seed in as part of that assembly process, that's great. If not, you explain to the gathered crowd, these are the hand signals, this is how we facilitate an assembly. Everybody takes it in turns to speak. You keep an eye on the stack with the use of fingers. Nobody gets to talk for more than two minutes. So you explain that and you ask if there is anybody in the crowd that feels that either that they could hold that who ha or who has facilitation experience. Because often the people that have the skills you need will not be known to you. Um, so it can be very empowering to get the people who are gathered to do the facilitation rather than seeding facilitators into each of the breakout groups. So you're kind of saying this is completely within everybody's ability to do. Um, Okay, so into your breakout groups, note takers, just trying to gather the will of the group. So just recording what comes out of that. About half an hour well facilitated discussion. And then you give them a 10 minute warning after the half an hour. You now have 10 minutes to end the deliberation and this is for the note takers to feed back to the whole group to check that they have got the will of the group. This is where framing your assembly comes in. Do you have an assembly with 80 breakout groups? 
So how are you going to gather in that feedback? Because part of the assembly process is for those people to come up, the note takers to come up and tell the assembly what they've, what they've produced. This is part of the process. But if you want all of that feedback, you're going to have to maybe ask them to write it out. But you're not going to want, you know, X number of breakout groups to write out everything they discussed. So what are you going to ask for? You're going to ask for the three main points or the one most popular point. Or if you're very time limited and you have a massive assembly, maybe you ask them to use 10 words to just summarize the thing that they found the most important in their discussion. Or do you get them, you know, if you've got an assembly in a local group with, with five breakout groups, do they come up and actually just feedback everything that they, that they really thought was important? So this has to be, yeah. I was just going to say, like, if you've, if you've got a large group, one thing that uh, we've used really successfully in the past is each group gives 10 words. So that gives the flavor of what that group's been talking about. But then you ask them to provide you with their three points written on paper so that then, like, you've actually got their points and that could maybe feed into the next part of the process. And that's like, it's those, it's those three points they've written down, which are the uh, which is the feedback that goes forwards, but like the 10 words mean that everyone gets the feeling of what's been going on in the People's Assembly. So you got both parts there. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right, that's great. Okay, so this is part of your looking at, so you've called an assembly and all of a sudden 800 people turn up and you were gonna get them to feedback five points per group. So then you have to rethink it, but you have to frame that at the start so that people understand what is expected of them and how that's going to work. Yes. Then you have two really small breakout groups or one large breakout group. I've led assemblies at festivals where I've had six people, but they turned up, you know? And I can't go, oh, it's not really worth my while. There's only six of you. You know, they turned up because they wanted their voice to be heard. So, uh, you know, I've had assemblies where four people have turned up and I've gone, okay, well, let's do this. Let, let's see what we generate. Yes. If you had a huge group and you had five points that you were going to go through, would it be a good idea to maybe give three groups one point and another three groups another point? You could do. If you, well, you mean if you had five different areas that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, or you say we only we or you say we want you to feedback like Will said, ten words and write down your top three points and hand it in as written feedback so that it depends where the results are gonna go. So this is the last part of the assembly is that everybody comes back into the full assembly, all the note takers come up and feedback in the way that you have asked them to feedback verbally to the entire gathered crowd. If you are using an overall note taker to try to gauge the, uh, the, the, the points that get the most consensus of the whole assembly, then that note taker will look for consensus in the crowd. So as the note takers are feeding back to the whole crowd, that note taker will record the ones that got the most consensus. Or maybe you're uh, feeding back, but then the thing that you really want to generate is, is a volume of feedback, so then you get them to hand in their written points and that then forms the feedback. But it's also about where that feedback goes. So wh what are you actually trying to generate? And you need to think about that before you frame the assembly so that you can say, this is what will happen to what you generate in this assembly. It doesn't just go nowhere. You know, either this will form a decision that we, you know, that we move on, or this will go into a feedback process, or this will be how we move forward as a group. Yes. It, it, is there any way of repeating the cycle? So you do the whole assembly thing, get some feedback, use that as a starting point for the next... Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you, know, you can go through this process as many times as you like, really, until you get to a point where, where you feel like you've, you've reached your aims. Yes. Just wondering, are we going to use this today? Because we're all going to be looking at what we do in October. Yes. Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna have. I'm gonna have one more question, and then we're gonna go into the next group bit, and then uh, and then hopefully we'll have a bit of time afterwards for question and answers. Though I might have to take you guys that want to do that outside. Yeah. How do you handle minority opinions when the when the split is say 52 48? <laughs> <laughs> Then that, then that, that's. I'm sure that that's not the going to be the point that is the generated the most consensus. So if you have a point that is really divisive, 
it's probably not going to be the thing that comes through the assembly. The things that are going to come out of the assembly are going to be the things that, that, that got the most consensus. There's always going to be divisions, but we're always going to have common ground. And it's finding the common ground. Yeah. Uh, also, like, if there was one point that's really divisive, then you could say, okay, so the piece of feedback we're going to give is, there was this one point, it was really divisive, you know, like, and then that's the feedback you give. I think my point actually was that if, if, if you have a minority point, say one third of the, of, of the assembled uh, population, then maybe you might find that, n that none of the groups actually report it, because in all the groups, the majority will report it, and that's the minority point of view is completely lost. That's generally when you would ask, so if you want to gauge a, a, a really good in-depth understanding of the concerns of a whole group, then you might get them to feedback one point, but record five points. So it may be the one or two points that got the, the most consensus aren't the, the overall, uh, you know, priority of the group. But if you get them to write down five or six points to feedback, then sometimes you will find that there's a point that never made it up further than point five. So it's not the, the top thing, but there is a thread through the feedback. That's why it's often really good to ask for written feedback. Just to better quickly um, respond to what you said there. So if, if you've got something that is not, not consensus, then this isn't very good at the dealing room. So it wouldn't solve Brexit, for instance. But well, you, well, I tell you what, if we got everybody involved, uh, if, we, if we rolled people's assemblies out across the whole of the United Kingdom to discuss Brexit, I think we'd make a lot more ground. What we lack is uh, the, uh, <laughs> there we go. What we lack is a culture of getting together in a way that is facilitated so that people have their voices heard and we don't interrupt or dominate. If we actually get people together in a room and listen, we make a lot more progress. Yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to the next bit because otherwise we're just never going to have enough time. Sorry, it's a, it should be about two and a half hours this, so. Okay, this is going to be done super quick because then I've got to leg it and facilitate another thing. Right, so in order to practice, um, framing your question and the feedback, hopefully people can read my writing, we've got three possible, we've got three possible um, uh, scenarios that you can think about, okay? So... Um, here's three possible people's assembly scenarios. The first one is you're using a people's assembly to do some outreach. So you're in a community hall or something like that. You got around th you're expecting 300 people to turn up and you've got a mixed group of both people who have never done this before, never engaged with anything like this before, and some people who are maybe like Extinction Rebellion rebels and want to get involved in some like interesting discussions. And we want you to come up with a question. So for each of these scenarios, we want firstly, what question are you going to ask? What question are you going to ask? Secondly, what feedback are you going to ask for? So how are you going to structure that feedback? And thirdly, what are you going to do with that feedback after the assembly once you've done it? Okay, so those are your three questions. And you've got, so this outreach assembly, what question are you going to ask those people? 300 mixed people and you want to get them thinking about some sort of issue, get them like motivated to discuss an issue around possibly climate change. Secondly, using a people's assembly in a local group, okay? It's in a local group, there's been a restructuring proposal from the coordinators. Maybe the restructuring proposal could be something like, we think we should be providing food at the start of all of our meetings. Okay, some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, restructuring proposal. You're going to have about 100 people turn up and they are all rebels. Okay, so we want to know what question you're going to ask them about that proposal. And thirdly, the third scenario you could consider is you're on an occupation, say for instance, uh, Oxford Circus, and the question is, should we stay or should we go? You've been holding the space for two days, there's been mass arrests, you're feeling pretty tired, and you want to know, are we going to maintain our occupation or are we going to clear off, okay? And you reckon there's gonna be about 200 people there, and again, mixed uh, people have just like shown up and are just like interested in what's going on, and uh, a load of rebels who are probably pretty tired because they've been sitting on roadblocks for ages with loads of people getting arrested, okay? So those are your three scenarios, and you've got these three questions. What question are you going to ask? What feedback are you going to ask for? And what are you going to do with the feedback, okay? Um, I'd like you to discuss, choose one of the scenarios, come up with your three answers. Oh my God, it's like three minutes before the end of the session. I have a proposal. Okay, so what we can do right now is a temperature check, okay? I have a proposal, my proposal is that as we've got three minutes left, 
that we as a group that we as a group move out onto the lawn and sit in our groups to go through this. I will bring all of this. Will will disappear because uh, he has to. Um, and then we can actually just have a go at doing that and feeding back on that and do a bit of Q&A on the lawn before I have to leave.